people are welcoming you today. It is Tuesday, May the 12th. And this, of course, is our fifth week of Easter. We're so grateful that you've had the opportunity to join us. And I hope celebrate this wonderful season of Easter. And so let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings upon us. Bless our time together as we study your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, last week, we took a little diversion, did uh, some a time of music. Today, of course, we're doing a little Bible study. Next week, we're going to also do another time of music. And so we hope that you're enjoying these little Tuesday evening times of worship, times of Bible study. So something again different today, going back to a little Bible study. We'd like to read from the book of Acts, the second chapter. This is, of course, one of the great lessons that we read during the season of Easter. And so let's take a look. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Now, the disciples were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. All those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all, favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open up this word to us today, that we might understand why this is important for us to hear what the early church was doing and how you transformed the world through them. We just give you thanks, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, as we look at this lesson, we begin verse 42 of this lesson, about the four... Ah, that's not a very good one. Let's find a better one. Four commitments... of the early Christians... They had four things, according to chapter, uh, uh, this chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they were dedicating themselves to. Number one thing they dedicated themselves to was the apostles' teaching. Now that's kind of an interesting word there, because it's something that we're introduced to in the book of Acts, the word apostles. Now, typically, when we think of the apostles, or the disciples, we think of the disciples, the 12 disciples. Now, obviously, Jesus had more disciples than those 12. This was very specifically referring to those 12, actually 11, because remember, we lost Judas, and that was kind of a sad event, that he could not wait until the day of resurrection to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. That is one of those things that always saddens me about Judas. I think if Judas had just waited to see the resurrection in the same way that Peter did. Because Peter, you know, he made basically the exact same mistake as Judas did. He betrayed him, denied him, turned his back on the one whom he loved. But Peter waited until he saw the resurrection and his life was changed. I think the same would have happened to Judas. And so that is always one of the sadness one of the great sadness, I think, of the uh, gospel lesson. We lost one of the apostles, uh, one of the early, one of the great uh, disciples of the church in Judas, and could have been such a great apostle. But the apostles were, again, those 11, and they, of course, were witnesses to the resurrection and had been with Jesus, and this is why their teaching was seen as so authoritative. Other folks had some wonderful things to say, but these men had seen the resurrection. It's the same reason why we have certain... Uh, books in the Bible and the New Testament, and why other books that were just fantastic books, like First Clement, were left out of the New Testament, because Clement um, was a second-generation Christian. He did not witness the resurrection. These men were respected because they saw this Jesus. They had had an experience with him. So we we're told that they committed themselves to that teaching, since they were the authority of the church. We we're also told they dedicated themselves to fellowship, The second thing, this is where our faith is sustained, in the fellowship of other Christians. I have, not made a, I have not made a secret of this at all. I went through a season, probably eight to ten year period of time, where I really wrestled and struggled with my faith. 
while being the pastor, or sometimes I would come to church and say, I'm not sure I believe this. But what is amazing, I told this and confessed to this congregation, and the congregation believed on my behalf. They uplifted me during this season of great struggle and doubt. And I just kept taking step forward in faith, and a step forward in faith because of them. It is in the fellowship of Christians that our faith is nurtured and sustained. I am still here today because of you. I give thanks for this fellowship. That is where faith is sustained and nourished. There's another thing that they dedicate themselves to. The breaking of bread. Now this, of course, is a shorthand way, or maybe not shorthanded so much, as referring to what we now talk about as communion. But it wasn't exactly the same type of communion that we celebrate today. Today we have these little tasteless wafers that melt on your tongue and you have a little tidbit of wine and we call that communion. But in the early church, they actually participated in a feast. Every single night they would gather together in someone's home, it said, and they would partake of a meal. And while they're partaking of the meal, they would break the bread in memory and remembrance of what Christ has done for them. It's a way of living in this relationship with Christ as a fellowship of believers, breaking the bread and acknowledging Christ's presence with us to transform our lives and to forgive sins and to strengthen us for life. So once again, they're nurtured in the fellowship with one another. They're nurtured together as both physically when they partake of the breaking of the bread because they're eating together, but they're also feasting on Jesus Christ together. Communion, by the way, is not something that we do by ourselves. Okay, it's something we are supposed to do with the fellowship of Christians. That's why we have not been partaking as a church and Holy Communion individually in our homes. We just don't, we don't, we don't do that. That's not our deal. Communion is meant to be done in the fellowship of Christians. We will hopefully be breaking our fast very shortly. We can gather together once again as brothers and sisters and partake of that meal. But then they also dedicated themselves to one other thing, and that's prayer. Now when we think of prayer, we often think of prayer telling God what we need. God, I need this, I need, need, need a... I need a BMW, God, and I need a million dollars, and I need uh, this, and I need a brand new house, and blah, blah, blah. And see, that's, that's I hate to say, that's the way a, lot of, way a lot of people pray. They think prayer is about asking God for things. But if you look at, say, for instance, I don't know, the Psalms, and you see the type of prayer of the faithful Jews, prayer was confession. God, I hate that neighbor that's over there. I hate what that person has done to me. I'm going through a time of despair. It's confession. It's unloading the heartaches of my day upon God, saying, God, I'm really struggling. You know, I was just talking with somebody who just lost her husband. It's a hard time for her. This is during this, this pandemic and what's going on, and it's a difficult challenge. She's just heartbroken. I can't imagine what she's going through. And she says, why does God allow this? And I said, I don't know. I'm not going to be flippant with this, but I will tell you, why don't you say that to God? Because that's what the psalmist would do. God, I'm really ticked off that you would take my husband from me. That's prayer. Prayer is that confession. Prayer is that, that sharing of that angst. But it's also something else. It's also thanksgiving. It's not asking for things. It's God, for us to get closer we got something dividing us, God, and this is going on in my life right now, and you better listen to me. And God, I acknowledge what you have done for me, and I am so grateful. Prayers also a thanksgiving. So prayer is an expression of our feelings and of our gratitude for all that God has done for us. Now what's amazing about this is that at this point, this lesson takes a turn. After that we find out what they dedicated themselves to, something happened. When you dedicate yourselves to the Lord's teaching, to a fellowship with other Christians, to breaking of bread with one another in prayer. Notice again, all of these things require, at least these first three, 
require the presence of other Christians. Prayer, yeah, you can do that on your own, and that's fine. But all of this is a team activity. It requires other Christians in your life. You cannot just have a developing relationship with God by yourself at home without being surrounded by other Christians. Your faith will die if you are not surrounded by others. So again, notice how important other people were in their relationship with God. Everything here has to do with my relationship with God and one another. So when they dedicated themselves to these things, something happened to their lives. Their lives were transformed. Oh, excuse me. So because of these four commitments, something happened. So there was a result. You know, it's like uh, if you dedicate yourself to a time or a season of exercise, lifting weights, you will, at the end of that season, notice a difference. I always tell my kids, uh, I always tell my kids on the track team, I said, look, go and take a look at your gums, your, your arms. At the beginning of the track season, take a picture of them. I said, I said well, don't, you don't have to show it to anybody else, just take a picture. I said, at the end of the track season, take a picture again at the exact same place and in the exact same way, and you will notice a huge difference at the end of three or four months. The difference, because you dedicated yourself to this time and this season of exercise. Just be amazed. It's a way to encourage them, to encourage them to keep doing it. The same thing is true when you dedicate yourselves to those types of four commitments of the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and prayer. Something is going to happen. There's going to be a result that's going to be noticeable. And so the very first thing they said that was noticeable were signs and wonders. Amazing things started to happen. Now this I can tell you, when you dedicate yourselves to these four things, amazing things will happen through us. Not just through you, through us. Remember again, being a Christian is a team sport. So when signs and wonders happen, they happen through us. Now, you may not be a miracle worker. You may not do spectacular things on your own. But we together do some amazing things. I mean, the last few weeks here, our church has been amazing. We've been feeding people in our community. 15 to 20 families a week. It's been crazy. I can't do that on my own. None of us can. So somebody will bring a few canned goods, and another person will bring a few canned goods. Another person will donate 100 bucks. Another person will donate this. And next thing you know, it, our pantry is filled, and we're able to feed these families. We together do some spectacular things, some amazing signs and wonders, because we are together. But that's not all. The second thing that happens is they become generous. Generosity is a result of us being together and learning about each other. And, and this, I just want to spend a little bit of time with this, just a few moments. It says, all those who believed were together and they shared all things in common. And they sold their property and possessions and shared them with all as anyone might have need. Now I'm going to caution you. There are some Christians who politicize this passage of scripture and say, see, the Christians, the early Christians were communists. They were not communists. They were communalists. What's the difference? In communism, you are told that you have no rights and you can't have your property. It all belongs to everybody. In communalism, I by choice give up my property. Nobody tells me, and oh, by the way, if I no longer want to live this way, I can leave the communal system. I don't have to live that way. I don't think you can do that under communism. Communism is forced and thrust upon you. So I am going to, so let's not make this political. Communalism is not communism. It, this Bible passage does not imply any human political ism or system. All political systems, Communism, socialism, capitalism, 
you know, everything, any ism on this planet dethrones God from the center and puts human-made uh, structures in the center of our lives. None of those are of God. So here's what I'm going to say. If Jesus isn't sitting on the throne, if there's any other law but the law of love, then your politics are not of the kingdom of heaven. Communism is not of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Because Jesus doesn't sit in the throne in the middle of communism. And there's more than one law, the law of love. And oh, people are forced to be obedient by threat of law. So communalism is a much different thing than communism. They were generous because God changed their lives. There was no force going on here. They could come and go as they chose. It was because they were grateful they shared of what they had as communalists. We go on. Number three. God, and this is the important word here, God, 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 added numbers. God added to their numbers day by day, verse 47. They praised God, they had favor with all the people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Now, notice again, this is kingdom growth. This isn't about congregational growth. This is about the kingdom of God. A lot of congregations make it about their congregation. We need to grow our churches. Church growth in a lot of cases is just basically taking members from another congregation and making them your own members. Oh, we grew our church. You're not growing the church when you take members from one congregation and put them in another one. You're just rearranging the, the uh, furniture on the, on the Titanic. That's all you're doing. Okay? Big deal. It doesn't do anything. These, were, these people, these early Christians, were adding numbers to the kingdom of heaven. Not to their congregations, to the kingdom of heaven. You know, back in the 90s, you know, all of us pastors were just really big on, oh, church growth, church growth, big church growth movement. How do we grow our congregations and blah, 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 blah. You know, at some point, we just have to stop worrying about it. Because who grows the kingdom? God does. It's not about growing our congregations. It's about God, through us, growing the kingdom of heaven. God is the one that does it. It's not any program. It's not any congregation. It's not about congregational growth. It's about adding people to the family of God. I do believe that God wants to do some spectacular things through us as a church. And when I say us as a church, I'm not talking about Holy Trinity. I'm not even just talking about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I'm talking about the Pentecostal churches, the Baptist churches, the Roman Catholic churches, the Methodist churches, the Lutheran churches. All of us together are God's church, God's people. God can do spectacular things through us when we stop worrying about our congregations, but we dedicate ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to our fellowship with one another, to breaking of bread together, prayer. God will then do spectacular things through us. Let us pray. Holy Father, we do give you thanks again for the spectacular things that you can do through us. Not me. Not any one of us individually, but when we dedicate ourselves to you and to one another, you will do some amazing things through us. So transform our lives. Give us a spirit of gratitude. Let us share of what we've received. Let us give it with gladness and continue to transform this world. We pray for kingdom growth, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.